In De- Deuteronomy uh, chapter f- 5, verse 6, I am Yahweh your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourselves an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them. For I, Yahweh your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and on the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me. And if you were worshiping another, another God, the context of that, if, if you're worshiping another God, if you're worshiping an idol in the stead of God, that's the same as hating him. That's hating him. But showing loving kindness to thousands of those that love me and keep my commandments. In uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6, in verse 4, this is the great Shema. Hear, O Israel, <laughs> hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. This is um, referred to as the Shema. This is the, the core, the heart of the law. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, Yahweh, is our God. Again, anytime you see the words L-O-R-D, capital letters, that is uh, in the place of Yahweh. Hear, O Israel, Yahweh is our God. Yahweh is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons, and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. You should bind them on the sign on your hands, and so on it goes. In um, chapter 7, verse 9. Know therefore that Yahweh, your God, Yahweh your God, He is God, the faithful God, who keeps His covenant and His loving kindness to thousand generations with those who love Him and keep His commandment, but repays those who hate Him to their faces to destroy them. He will not delay with Him who hates Him. He will repay Him to His face. Therefore, keep you shall keep the commandments and the statutes and the judgments which I am commanding you today to do. The first one is Yahweh is one and is to be worshipped as the one true God. Chapter 10, verse 17. I could do this all day long going through Deuteronomy and, and uh, through, through the, uh, the first five books of the Bible. 10, 17. For Yahweh your God is the God of gods, the Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, the awesome God, who does not show partiality, and he doesn't take bribes. He executes justice for the orphan and the widow. He shows his love for the alien by giving him food and clothing. So so show your love for the alien, for the aliens, for you are aliens in the land of Egypt. You shall fear Yahweh your God. You shall serve him and cling to him, and you shall swear by his name. He is your praise. He is your God who has done this great and awesome things for you which your eyes have seen. Your fathers went down to Egypt, 70 persons in all, and now Yahweh your God has made you as numerous as the stars of heaven. Uh, I, I have learned through my study of the scriptures that God doesn't, he's not like a human. He, he is calculated. When he uses his words, he is precise. Um, he's not repetitious for no reason. Sometimes we're just repetitious because we forget we just said it. You know. But God isn't that way. He is very calculated. For him to say over and over and over and over again, hundreds, thousands of times, identifying himself as Yahweh our God, we would have to be you know, foolish to not take knowledge of this and to stand up and to, and to declare boldly who our God is and what our God is about and who he is. He identifies himself well. Um, 
it, with such redundancy so that there can be no mistake. But you, you'll make mistakes if you don't read the book. <laughs> this is the book that makes him known. I mean, everybody's got an opinion about God. Go to the mall. Talk to every person you come in contact with. Every single person you meet has an opinion about God. Some people believe there is no God, but they have an opinion then, don't they? So everybody's got an opinion. Having an opinion about God or having the popular opinion, what everybody else believes, doesn't mean you know anything about Him. The way He has made Himself known to the world is written in the Scriptures. And so you don't guess about it so that you really know. I mean, the best way to learn about somebody is to talk to them. Or if they wrote a book about themselves, read the book. <laughs> you know, don't read a book that somebody else wrote about them. You know, I don't know what that woman wrote about A-Rod. I don't know if that's true. Now, if A-Rod wrote the book about himself, I, you know, that would, I would put more weight to that. But God had this book written. This is his words. This is his explanation of who he is. Read the book if you want to know him. And uh, go to Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament. When you read through the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, um, Ezekiel, Daniel, you know, uh, all of the prophets, every single one of them, save none, every single one of them, their, their message is the same, their communication is the same. If their reproof to Israel is, Yahweh is God, worship Him alone. That's the message. That's the gospel message of the prophets. I don't know if it was a gospel message. It's the, it's the message of the prophets. I don't know if it was a good news message to Israel when they heard it. It should have been. Um, Malachi chapter 3 Verse 5, Then I will draw near to you for judgment, and I will be swift witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, against those who falsely swear, against those who oppress the wage earnings in his wages, the widow, the orphan, and those who turn aside alien and not fear me, says Yahweh of hosts. For I, Yahweh, do not what? I, Yahweh, do not change. Therefore you, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed. For the days of your fathers you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, say Yahweh of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? It goes on and talks about tithing. I am Yahweh. I do not change. doesn't change. He is who he is and who he's always been. And he will always be. As a matter of fact, it says that in, in the book of Revelation. I was, uh, he who was, is, and is to come. His identity has not changed, and it certainly has not changed with the birth of his son. Almost 6,000 times, <laughs> Yahweh is used in the Old Testament. That's a lot of times, providing a voluminous amount of information about our God. Yet, not once... Not once is there the slightest indication in the 6,000 times that his name is used. Not once is there three in one. Contrarywise, it is powerfully, emphatically communicated to us that Yahweh is one. Yet the commonly accepted belief of most Christians today is the Trinity. The Trinity is a dogma of, of the unity of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the three persons in the one Godhead. Yet the word Trinity is not found in any of the Hebrew texts, any of the Aramaic texts, or any of the Greek texts. It's not found in most, it's not in, in, in most, it might be in some of the modern translations, but in the King James Bible and most of the Bibles that you have, you won't find the word because it's not a word that existed, because it's a, it's a dogma and a doctrine that did not exist. Again, the Encyclopedia Britannica explains. And, and uh, you know, let me say this about the, the encyclopedia. And the reason I chose this as opposed to many other sources I could have used tonight, the, the encyclopedia is a nonpartisan resource. I mean, it's not, it's not a, it ha, it's not, it's information that states clearly um, without prejudice. The, the, it's not like this is the opinion or the religious persuasion of the one that's writing it. 
This is just information. This is just the historical information. That's what encyclopedias do. They give you information, right? <laughs> you look something up. Look up the word Trinity in the Encyclopedia Britannica. Neither the... Um, and this is what it said. Neither the word Trinity nor the explicit doctrine appears in the New Testament. Nor did Jesus and his followers intend to contradict the Shema in the Hebrew Scriptures. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. We just read that in Deuteronomy 6.4. The Encyclopedia Britannica says the Trinity doctrine does not appear in the New Testament. Nor did Jesus and his disciples try to contradict the Shema, which is, the Lord thy God is one. The earliest Christians, however, had to cope with the implications of the coming of Jesus Christ and of the presumed presence and power of God among them, i.e. the Holy Spirit, whose coming was connected with the celebration of Pentecost. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit were associated in such New Testament passages as the Great Commission. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. That's Matthew 28, 19. And in the apostolic benediction, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. 2 Corinthians 13, 14. The, the person that wrote the Encyclopedia Britannica is saying, well... Maybe they took it from this information, you know, where it says the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, which out, without a doubt, the, the New Testament, specifically the New Testament, well, really the Old Testament too, but primarily the New Testament, talks about God, the Father. It talks about Jesus, the Son, and it talks about the Holy Spirit, and it talks about the three a lot. But it never says that the three are one. The doctrine developed gradually, over several centuries, now the doctrine developed gradually over several centuries through many controversies. Initially, both the requirements of monotheism, that's one God, inherited from the Hebrew scriptures and the implications of the need to interpret the biblical teachings of the Greco-Roman religious religions seem to demand seem to demand that the divine in Christ as the word or the logos be interpreted as subordinate to the supreme being. An alternate solution was to interpret Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as three mo mods, mo John, say that for me, modes, uh, a substance of self-disclosure, disclosure of one God, but not as distinct within the being of God himself. The first tendency recognized the distinctiveness among the three, but at the cost of their equality and hence of their unity, sub, sub, subordinationism. The second came to terms with the, their unity, but at the cost of their distinctiveness as persons. It was not until the fourth century that the distinctiveness of the three and their uni unity were brought together in a single orthodox doctrine of one end's essence and three persons. In other words, he's saying before, before the fourth century, they had a hard time putting this together because it, it didn't fit. You can't have Jesus Christ being subordinate to God and being equal with God. That's contradictory. You know, and, and so they, they worked at it, and in the fourth century... They put this together at the Council of Nicaea in 325 stated the crucial belief, formula for the doctrine in the confession that the Son is the same substance as the Father, even though it said very little about the Holy Spirit. Over the next half century, it got steam, and eventually it became the doctrine that substantiated you know, this thing called the Trinity. In other words, the Encyclopedia Britannica is saying this is not a biblical concept, it's not in the Bible. You can't find it in the Bible. It's something that was put together three centuries after Christ was here on earth. Three cent now, so here's, here we come back to my beginning statement of the evening and the things that John was communicating the last time we were together and really the first time we were together. What is your standard for faith and practice? What is it that you're going to believe? 
If it's going to be the Scriptures, then you'll have difficulty with the Trinity because the Trinity is a non-scriptural doctrine. It is one that was put together at the Nicene Council in 325 B.C. or A.D., after Christ. So it's something that was made up by men, and there's much more information. There's many books that you can read on this. It was made up by men basically for the purpose of uh, attracting pagan, pan, paganistic people into the Christian community. It was a means by which of, you know, it was a sacrifice for evangelism because uh, polytheism was rampant among the pagans as it always has been and this would be a way to compromise and to get these people to believe. Nonetheless, it's a non-biblical concept. The concept of the Old Testament the underpinnings of the Old Testament, the doctrine of the Old Testament, which is clearly communicated over and over and over again, is Yahweh is one. He is God. And New Testament makes known Jesus as the Son of God. Hundreds of times in the New Testament. Now, I told you in the Old Testament, thousands of times Yahweh is talked about as being God. 6,000 times. In the New Testament, hundreds of times, Jesus is spoken of as being the Son of God. There is not one time in the Old Testament or the New Testament where it says Jesus is God. There is not one time in the New Testament or the Old Testament that says that God is Jesus. There are over 6,000 times in the Old Testament where it explains who God is. There's hundreds of times in the New Testament that explains who Jesus is as the Son of God. He's called the Son of God hundreds of times. He is never called once God the Son. When you talk to a Trinitarian, you say to him, why do you believe in the Trinity if it's not written in the Scriptures? Well, it says in Matthew 28, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay, it says apples, oranges, and pears. Does that make them all apples? It says three different things. It doesn't say they're one. And, and I, don't, I don't mean to belittle or make fun of people's beliefs, but this is a, to say that this is paper thin is an understatement. It is so weak, it is so incredibly weak, that you would believe this, again, based upon the not one time, not ten times, not a hundred times, not a, a thousand times, six thousand times the name of God is used. We are without excuse to believe in such a doctrine. And not one time, not one, 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 one time is the word Trinity used. Not one time is God called Son. Not one time is Son called God. Uh, look at Exodus no, look at Ezekiel. Can you find it? Can you find it? Can you find it? Psalms, Proverbs, Song of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. It's before Daniel. We were in Daniel on Sunday, so maybe you can find it. That was great on Sunday. Ezekiel 25. <laughs> Ezekiel prophesies, at least in the section that I'm reading to you, about what's going to happen at the end of the age, when Jesus comes back as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. It says in Ezekiel 25, 17, I will execute great vengeance on them with wrathful rebukes, and they will know that I am Yahweh when I lay my vengeance on them. Just as it was understood in the time of Pharaoh, it was the vengeance of God or the judgment of God upon Pharaoh that the understanding came that Yahweh was God. So it will be at the end. In, Ex in Ezekiel 36, chapter 36, verse 22. Therefore say to the house of Israel, Thus saith Yahweh God, 
It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you went. I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, my great name, my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst, that the nations will know that I am Yahweh, declares Yahweh God. When I prove myself holy among you in their sight, for I will take you from the nations, gather you from all the lands, and bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean, and I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. You will live in the land that I give, that I gave to your forefathers, so you will be my people, and I will be your God. Moreover, I will save you from all of your uncleanness, and I will call for the grain and multiply it, and I will not bring a famine on you. I will multiply the fruit of the tree and produce the field, so that you will not receive again the disgrace of famine among the nations. Then you will remember your evil ways and your deeds that were not good, and you will loathe yourself in your own sight for your iniquities and your abominations. I am doing this for your sake. I am not doing this for your sake, declares Yahweh God. Let it be known to you. Be ashamed and confounded for your ways, O house of Israel. And then it goes on from there again. This is what's going to happen in the end. This is talking specifically to Israel. They're going to have this blessing and this judgment and this awareness and this understanding as is the whole world that Yahweh is God. I love, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. In the end, everybody's going to understand exactly that Yahweh is the one true God. Look at chapter 39, verse 7. My holy name, 39.7. My holy name, I will make known in the midst of my people Israel. I will let my holy name, I will not let my holy name be profound anymore. Today, the holy name of God is profound so frequently. It's so disheartening to those of us that love our God to hear his name used as a common curse word. Uh, where people profane it, uh, where they don't worship him the right way, where they disgrace him by their words and by their behavior. But here's, here's what's going to happen. My holy name I will make known in the midst of my people Israel. I will not let my holy name be profaned anymore. And all the nations will know that I am Yahweh, the Holy One in Israel. Behold, it is coming and it shall be done, declares Yahweh God. That is the day which I have spoken. <clears throat> then those who inhabit the cities of Israel will go out and make fires with weapons and burn them, both shields and bucklers, bows and arrows, war clubs, spears. For seven years they will make fires out of them. All the weapons of war are going to be burned in those first seven years when Jesus comes back. They will not... They will not take wood from the field or gather firewood from the forest for they will make fires with the weapons and they will take the spoil of those who despoiled them and seize them the plunder of those who plundered them declares Yahweh God and on that day I, when it goes on I, I like reading about that and I <laughs> you know about that great day what's going to happen when when uh, God comes uh, sends Jesus Christ back and um uh, and his name is finally magnified in the earth. In that day, there'll be no more profaning the name of God. There'll be no more confusion as to who the true God is. There'll, there'll, there'll be no more confusion as to who his son is. It will be perfectly understood. And, you know, we will, we will have holiness and understanding and live in unity with that God and with our Lord. In your notes, it says, Jesus knew the name of the Father, and he declared it to his disciples. I have made known, I have made your name known to them, from John 17, 26, and we'll make it known. I will proclaim your name to the brethren, according to Hebrews 2, 12, 
In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. The quotation from Psalms. Jesus made known the name of God to his disciples. In the New Testament, God's name is never used. Rather, it's replaced with the Greek word kurios. Many of the Old Testament verses that have the name Yahweh are quoted in the New, but were changed to kurios. Look at, uh, I want to show you this. Look at Deut uh, Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. Matthew is a good place to where you can do this with a relatively ease because of the way it's written. So you, 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 uh, you can gain the understanding. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 7, Jesus said to him, On the other hand, it is written, and it's written in Deuteronomy 6.16, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, if you go back to Deuteronomy 6.16, you'll look at that verse and you will see that the word Lord is in capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, which is an indication from the English Bible that it's the word what? Yahweh. And yet, here in the New Testament, it's again translated Lord, but it's not, it's not, from, it's not Yahweh. They just translated it Lord. So we have grave difficulty when we come to understanding who God is in the New Testament because Jesus is, you know, the advent of Jesus as the Son of God, the Messiah, our Savior, our Redeemer, you know, the, the one who is the perfect sacrifice for us. He is to be our Lord. He is our Lord, our Master. It is He that we follow. God has put Him in this exalted position so that Jesus is called Lord all the time in the New Testament. And because of a failure to accurately translate verses of Scripture like this, and because of the, of the Masorites or whoever made the decision in the translation of the, from the Hebrew text into the English text, they decided to translate the word Yahweh Lord. So now our understanding from the Old Testament is Lord, 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 Lord. We come to the New Testament and we see that Jesus is called Lord, 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 Lord. And since we don't read the Old Testament, we don't have the understanding that I just communicated to you, and we get all confused. And I understand that, and I'm very compassionate to that. But it's important for us to make these distinctions. Again, here's a clear example of how you can do that. You, it says, it is written, you go back to the Hebrew text, you see that it's talking about Yahweh, and, and that Yahweh, that Lord is to be Yahweh. I'm sorry... You know, I, I'm sorry that there is this error in translation, and I consider it to be an error. That, that well, no, let me, let me rephrase it. Instead of saying it's an error, I, that there, is, there was a failure to accurately communicate these truths so that there wouldn't be confusion. And, and had, they, had they everywhere in the Old Testament where the word Lord was used would have translated it Yahweh, and if they would have done that every place in the New Testament, instead of putting Curios for Yahweh or, or uh, Theos for God when it was talking about, you know, Yahweh. It would have made life so much easier and then there wouldn't be this confusion. I have to think that <clears throat> this is a grave mistake in the translations from the one language into the other language and that's why I'm taking the time to tell you this tonight. Uh, I, I also believe that if you read without prejudice... If you read without preconceived notions, if you read things in the context and you ask God to explain it to you, you can tell the difference about who, who are we talking about. Are we talking about God or are we talking about Jesus? And it's almost, you know, 90% of the times it's very, very easy to read in the context and you'll, you'll grab hold of it. Another one of these is uh, Matthew 22. Or Matthew 4, since we're in Matthew 4, 4, 7, 4, 10, 4, 10, 4, 10, 4, 10. Go, Satan, for it is written in Deuteronomy 6, 13, you shall worship Yah the Lord. And again, if you go back to Deuteronomy 6, 13, it is Yahweh, your God, and serve him. So, you know, that word Lord, again, they translated it from the Greek. They made it curios. It's not really curios. It's Yahweh. And I have these other verses that are written here. You can look at them later on. 
In Matthew chapter 5, turn there please. Jesus introduces to us Yahweh in a different way and tells us to address him rather than address him as Yahweh or El Shaddai or Almighty, you know, the Almighty God or Elanon, uh, El, uh, the Most High God or Elohim, the Creator. Rather than addressing him as even Yahweh by his proper name, he tells us to call him Father. And uh, it says this in Matthew 5, 16. Let, all, let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. And, and um, 544. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be the sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes the sun to rise, and it goes on, verse 48. Therefore you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Chapter 6. Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise you have no reward with your Father. Verse 2. So when you give to the poor, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and the streets so that they may be honored of men. Truly I say to you, they have the reward. But when you give to the poor, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving will be in secret and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who stand in the synagogue, verse 6. But when you pray, go into your inner closet and quiet pray, verse 7. When you are praying, do not use meaningless repetitions. Verse 9, pray in this way. Our Father, who is in heaven. And what's the first thing he says to pray? Hallow be thy name. Hollow be thy name. How hollow can his name be if we don't know it? You know. <laughs> I understand the concern of not violating the second commandment of uh, taking the Lord's name in vain. But I don't think that was in relationship to saying his name as much as it was, as you see from the book of Ezekiel, it was the manner in which they lived, the manner in which they didn't have faith, how they worshipped other gods, how they disgraced their god, how they used his name flippantly. Um, the name of Yahweh, indeed, is not a name to be, you know, spoken disrespectfully. I, I, we were talking about my daughter's getting married, and we were talking about uh, giving a favor to the people that attend, you know, a gift to the people that attend. We, and I considered the possibility of giving um, a thing that would have Yahweh on it. And then um, as I contemplated it, I thought, nah, I really don't want to do that. But somebody, suppose somebody takes that gift and discards it and throws it in the garbage or takes that thing and just throws it in their closet or behind their bed or under the... I don't want that to happen to the name of God. I don't want to contribute to that. So I, I wouldn't do that. I decided against doing that. Um, I, I think that I think I need to be wise, and I, I need I need to be careful on how I use the name of God, because it's supposed to be hallowed. Hallowed is Thy name. <clears throat> I don't think it's supposed to be ignored. I don't think it's supposed to not be known. I think it should be known, and I think that uh, I'm thankful to to know it. I contemplated these the, these things for many years in my life, wondering, well, maybe maybe the the Masorites and the other people that were responsible for changing Yahweh to Lord and or Yahweh to Adonai and or to make up this Jehovah, maybe they were right. Maybe I should be, I shouldn't use this name. And you know, I reasoned that through, and but then I read the scripture, and I see how many times. He uses that name. Now, I'm sorry, you know, we don't speak Hebrew, but I do have, that, I do have the availability to go look at Hebrew texts and, and, and to understand these things. I have the ability to research and to understand, and I have, and I do. And, and, and I see that he is telling me over and over and over and over again his name. He wants me to know his name. You know, so 
It's not that I shouldn't say it or I shouldn't know it and then I shouldn't say it. It's that I should keep it hollow. I should keep it holy. Reverence, awe, not to be flippant about it. Um, So Jesus introduces Yahweh to us as Father. And um, so in my prayers to God, my Father, I don't, I don't say Yahweh. I say Father, because that's what my Lord Jesus instructed me to do. When I pray, I say Father, and I pray to him in the name of Jesus Christ. I don't pray to Yahweh, but I... When I teach and I speak about the God who created the heavens and the earth, I let people know clearly that his name is Yahweh. Those of you who heard me teach, I, I automatically now, when I read the Old Testament, rather than saying the words Lord when it's supposed to be Yahweh, I say Yahweh. I mostly do. I, sometimes I, I miss it. but Because I think that people should know the true God's name. And um, Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Verse 6, for yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom are all things, and we exist from him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we exist through him. That's not saying there's only the two of them are one. It's saying that there's two. <laughs> there's two. There is one God, the Father, from whom all things, and we exist from him. And one Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter 1. Now Jesus has unity with the Father, where he always did the will of the Father, and is always in conjunction with the will of the Father. They are one in will and purpose. They are one in... I mean, Jesus has, in subordination to one, the one true God, he has always done the will of the Father. So they are certainly one in that regard. Um, they are both to be reverenced and to be awed and, and to be worshipped. Uh, but make no mistake, Jesus came to make known the name of the Father. And Jesus came to bring people to the Father. Jesus came worshipping Yahweh as God. And he instructed others to do the same. He didn't instruct people to worship him. He instructed people to worship God. In, in Ephesians chapter 1, it says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are at Ephesus, who are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace, verse 2, grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. It doesn't say God, our Father, who is the Lord Jesus Christ. It says God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is like He's our God and Father. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ. I think that's pretty clear. Jesus is Lord. Yahweh is our God and our Father. In closing, I'd like to go to Exodus 34. This is a description of the God we worship. Some of the characteristics, certainly not all of them, but some of the characteristics, when he made himself known to Moses, Moses wanted to see him more fully. It says in Exodus 34, verse 5, or verse 6, Then Yahweh passed by in front of Moses and proclaimed, and again those words, the Lord, are the one word in the Hebrew, Yahweh. Then Yahweh, verse 6 again, Then Yahweh passed by in front of Moses and proclaimed, Yahweh, 
Yahweh God. Compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. Yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generation. That's the God of the Bible. That's who he is. That's his identity. It's a monotheistic God. Mono meaning one theistic God, one God. Not polytheistic, or, you know, not many gods, not three gods. There's only one God. There's one Lord Jesus Christ. 